Good afternoon. This hearing will come to order. I'm chairing today's hearing because sadly, Chairwoman Vicki Hartzler's father has just passed away. Certainly all of us here are mindful of the sad time for Chairwoman Hartzler and her, and her family, and our thoughts and prayers are with them. And Chairwoman Hartzler was eager that this hearing take place notwithstanding these sad circumstances, and this is because the Armed Services Committee is deeply interested in the security clearance process. It's essential that a rigorous, fair, and expedient process exists to identify individuals who should be allowed to access classified government data. Without a sound security system, our nation's safety is potentially endangered and military readiness harmed. It is the Oversight Subcommittee's fifth event on this topic. Today we will receive another mandated quarterly briefing on the security clearance process. Among other topics, we will hear about the size of the clearance background, or backlog, I should say, the trends of the backlog, and the management initiatives to address it. I'm also interested in learning about the status of the Department of Defense's assumption of responsibility for background investigations and the transition of the management of that process from the National Background Investigations Bureau. I now turn to my colleague, Ranking Member Seth Moulton, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Gates, and I also want to express my sympathies to uh, Vicki Hartzler and her family. Today marks our subcommittee's fifth discussion on reforms to the Department of Defense's background investigation and security clearance process. Over the last six months, the National Background Investigations Bureau has made some notable improvements by significantly lowering the investigation backlog. However, every day the backlog exists, we are delaying the hiring of qualified national security personnel, which threatens to disrupt U.S. economic growth and military readiness. In June, the administration formally announced its plan to transfer responsibility of background investigations for all federal agencies to the Department of Defense. Today, I am looking forward to hearing an update from our witnesses on the personal personnel conversion process for OPM employees and any additional costs incurred or authorities required to keep this tra transition on track. While I agree that we need to streamline the background investigation process, I am skeptical of DOD's current ability to absorb such a cumbersome task. Furthermore, I remain concerned about the current strategy as we must ensure that we are not expediting the investigation portion of, security clearance, of the security clearance process while unintentionally backlogging the adjudication portion of the process. I look forward to hearing what efforts the department is undertaking to ensure clearances won't be delayed in another part of an already laborious system. We must also be careful not to sacrifice thoroughness and accuracy for the sole purpose of achieving efficiency. I'm aware that DOD is using continuous evaluation and automated processes to reduce the investigative timeline for periodic reinvestigations, and it appears to be having a positive effect. While there are benefits to using technology to expedite the review of security clearance investigations, there are limits to the role that technology can play. Portions of the investigative process, such as reference interviews, cannot be replaced. While some progress has been made, I am eager to hear more today about further steps the department has taken towards resolving these issues. Thank you, and I look forward to your testimony, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Moulton. Our briefers today are Mr. Gary Reed, Director of Defense Intelligence in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Mr. Dan Payne, Director of the Defense Security Service, and Mr. Charles, Charles Phelan, the Director of the National Background Investigations Bureau. Thank you all for being here. Mr. Reed, will you please begin? Thank you, Congressman Gates and Ranking Member Moulton, other members here today and staff. Thank you for having us over today to update you on where we are with our ongoing work to reform the federal vetting enterprise. And we'll talk about everything you just mentioned in terms of security clearance processing, uh, changes in the system and progress made to date. Uh, since we were here last, we have continued to collaborate closely from within DOD, the Defense Security Service, and the National Background Investigations Bureau uh, on the planning uh, to prepare for what you just mentioned, uh, Ranking Member Moulton, this upcoming transfer. I'd like to hit on a few key points that have occurred since we were here last. Uh, as already mentioned, in June, the administration announced that the investigative activities currently performed by NBIB would be consolidated with similar activities mandated to the Department of Defense. This was in light of the previous year's National Defense Authorization Act, which directed us to transfer the DOD portion of that mission to the department. Subsequent to that, within the executive branch, there was a review and analysis of government efficiencies more broadly, and it was assessed that to maintain the greatest degree of efficiency, the full mission would be transferred to DOD. Uh, we were very supportive of this decision, frankly. Uh, we were working uh, through the process of splitting out of an enterprise, and there's risk associated with that, and, and uh, 
this is actually much more streamlined for us from an efficiency standpoint, uh, and, and it has served to increase our collaboration across the board. Uh, we continue to do that planning. Uh, we are not executing that just yet, uh, but we soon will be uh, once the uh, final guidance is promulgated and issued uh, by the president. So we're continuing to plan for that. Uh, but we're not staying idle. Uh, as you mentioned, Congressman, uh, these interim measures that were announced in June included uh, additional options that would streamline the process, uh, cut out some of the man hours, uh, and speed things through uh, the investigative uh, cycle. Uh, they included the ability to apply continuous evaluation and automated, automated records check uh, as a way of offsetting some of that, and frankly, as a way of not adding new work to NBIB's existing work stream. We in the Department of Defense implemented that guidance on the last day of July, uh, so about four months ago. We've been working very closely with NBIB and our Performance Accountability Council partners to implement these and help reduce uh, the inventory. Uh, we're pleased to say that over that period of time, we're near a 20% reduction in the overall for the DOD side of the inventory. Uh, it's, you know, we're 80% of the total anyways, so across the board, we're realizing those benefits in the 18 to 22% range that were envisioned when these measures were put in place. Uh, so in the aggregate, we're down uh, significantly from where we were uh, at the beginning of this year and, and, and where we were in the, in the summer. What's promising to us in the department about this development is the process that we are now implementing very much mirrors the process we advocated for in the plan we submitted to Congress uh, in 2017 under Section 951. Uh, which was a shift towards more use of continuous evaluation and automated records checking. So we're doing that now. We're realizing the benefits. We have a substantial cost avoidance factor that we've already realized by processing up to, I think we're about 20,000 now over the past uh, few months. Uh, so we're, this is the system that we wanted to implement later. We're actually able to implement it now. The plan we submitted in 2017 we were directed subsequently by Congress to implement by October of 2020. We actually implemented the guts of that plan in July of this year. Uh, and it really, um, as a function of the inventory and the pressure to get that down, it actually helped us speed up something that we were working through and intended to do already. So we think that's a good development. Uh, it sets us on the path to what will follow, which is transfer and transition of this process uh, for all the reasons you've already described. We're working very closely with the committee, with our industry partners, with academia, think tanks, and others uh, across the intellectual and commercial and government space to identify best practices and help guide us through this transition that comes ahead. We've uh, solicited support of mergers and integration experts to help planning this transfer. It's a very large enterprise going from one branch of the government to another, and there are hosts of executive orders and laws that apply to these agencies and we're going through that deliberate planning right now in anticipation of making the transfer. Throughout that time, we will continue to focus on the daily mission of getting down the inventory for the reasons you've already mentioned and working with NBIB to help streamline that process as much as possible. Uh, Congressman, you mentioned, and we've heard it often, that uh, there's some skepticism that we're able to do this. I can only tell you that we have the support from the highest levels within our department, from the secretary and the deputy secretary, and my boss, the undersecretary, uh, the chief management officer, and many other principals within the Pentagon are focused on this issue. We have strong support from OMB, uh, from Ms. Weikert, who's also the acting OPM director, to help this through, from our executive agent offices at the DNI and at OPM. We are all pulling on this rope together. We're all cognizant of the significant challenges ahead, and we're equal, equally cognizant of the necessity to do this mission on a daily basis. And we, we go into this uh, clear-eyed, but understanding that it is a significant undertaking. It won't happen overnight. This will evolve over a period of months. Uh, we'll keep the mission going, we'll make the improvements, and we'll do the transfers, and we'll get on with the future construct. Look forward to addressing your questions and engaging in the conversation with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Mr. Payne? Congressman Gates, Ranking Member Moulton, distinguished members of the committee, uh, it is an honor to appear before you today representing the dedicated men and women of the Defense Security Service as we absorb the background investigation mission uh, from the Office of uh, uh, 
Personnel Management's uh, National Background and Investigations Bureau. As you know, we went, met with you and your staff several times this year on the status of the investigation mission transfer. Today, I want to provide an update on our progress since our last meeting and my philosophy moving forward. Uh, to set the stage, uh, as, uh, as Mr. Reed just outlined, Section 925 of uh, FY18 NDAA directed that we transfer only the DOD portion of the background investigation mission, um, however, commencing, uh, commencing no later than 1 October 2020. Uh, DOD background investigations uh, represent approximately roughly 70% uh, or so of NBIB's entire investigations workload. Separately, in June of this year, the administration announced a government reform plan, which included recommendations for streamlining the federal government. One of the recommendations called for a complete transfer of NBIB to DOD. We are awaiting an executive order that will codify the recommendations, giving the Secretary of Defense the authority he needs to execute the entirety of the background investigation's mission and establish timelines for the NBIB DOD transfer. How we conduct the transfer will be critically important. Uh, we are expecting that the executive order will, will allow us to integrate the NBIB structure into DSS in a way that will not uh, reverse or impact the great progress that NBIB has made in drawing down their investigative inventory while allowing DSS to continue the progress we have made in innovation and transforming the vetting process. As we continue to innovate and employ new measures mandated by ODNI's Trusted Workforce 2.0, our structure will change accordingly. To facilitate this transfer, I am working closely with Mr. Phelan to integrate the NBIB senior staff into DSS in order to capitalize on their expertise and experience. We want to ensure we have the best and the brightest minds at the table and that we continue to build on the progress NBIB has made. Below the senior staff levels, I know that employees of both agencies are concerned about their jobs, their duty locations, their chains of command. I am committed to minimizing the disruption to both field workforces, uh, the people on the ground doing the work and accomplishing our mission. I think our approach will do just that. Uh, however, let me be clear, this transfer is incredibly complex. We are integrating two organizations into DSS while simultaneously automating and changing operational processes and procedures. Everyone at this table recognizes these complexities and are resolute in ensuring it is done successfully. We have worked with NBIB to develop a joint transfer plan, which provides a high-level roadmap for the transfer, and we are continuing to develop a detailed step-by-step -step blueprint that will capture all of the actions necessary to complete the transfer, touching all functional areas. We are also establishing a joint transition team within DSS that will implement these plans and work the myriad of details required for the, a successful transfer. While we work these transfer details, DSS is continuing its own innovation efforts. The executive correspondence signed in June by the Director of National Intelligence and the Director of OPM allowed us to execute new measures for certain periodic reinvestigations and enroll them into con uh, continuous evaluation program. This action allowed us to reduce the number of new cases being submitted to NBIB. It also allowed us to focus our attention on high-risk cases and begin to develop a risk-based approach to personnel vetting. While we are continuing to refine our processes and business rules, we are already seeing success in reducing the backlog and fo focusing our efforts on those elevated risk individuals within our cleared workforce. The administration's June reform plan stated, now is the time for bold transformation change in how we vet our workforce. I could not agree more. I think the progress DSS and NBIB have made this year positions us all well for success and will truly lead to a modern, risk-based, technology-enabled personnel vetting model. Finally, I'd like to thank the members of the committee uh, for your continued interest in not only the NBIB transfer, but in the important work that DSS does every day in personnel vetting, securing critical technology and the defense of the industrial base, and conducting counterintelligence in order to preserve our nation's military and economic competitive advantages. With that, I am happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Phelan? 
Thank you, uh, Representative Gates, Ranking Member Moulton, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you here today. Uh, as you know, NBIB's mission is critical to the, as a critical element of this nation's efforts to ensure the integrity and the trustworthiness of the federal workforce. In this role, we are the primary background investigative service provider for the federal government. Each year, this program covers over two million individuals that require some, time of, some type of formal investigation. These individuals work in more than 100 departments and agencies that are made up of civilians, military members, and contractors from the over 15,000 companies covered under the National Industrial Security Program. Today, I'd like to quickly address three main focus areas that are critical to the success of this mission. Number one, our organizational transition from OPM to the Department of Defense, our current inventory and those mitigation efforts, and then a glimpse into the future. And as Gary and Dan have discussed, the successful transfer of NBIB from OPM to DOD is critical, and we're working closely with them daily, almost hourly, to ensure that, uh, that this is a seamless transfer. Uh, we fully support the intent expressed in the President's management agenda to keep this mission intact, and I believe this decision will ultimately be beneficial for the whole of government. That said, while there's a lot of focus on the future and the transfer and on transforming this mission, we have not been waiting for those final decisions before tackling the challenges that we face. The future is, it has been now, and uh, we, addressing this has been foremost in our minds. Uh, some quick numbers at its highest level, our inventory reached 725,000 investigative products this past April. Looking at the trending earlier today, I am pretty confident that sometime in the next 24 hours, that number will cross below the 600,000 mark, a reduction of over 17% in just six months. That number, 600,000, gets a lot of attention and is sometimes misconstrued as the number of government and industry employees waiting for a security clearance. That does not accurately portray the number of investigations pending in our inventory for initial national security clearances. That number is 275,000 of which about 110,000 are already at work on an interim clearance. While these numbers are not optimal, um, they are not as high as the 600,000, and we are working closely with our partner agencies to prioritize their more immediate requirements. Getting back to the overall inventory, the reduction that we have seen so far is a direct result of the following sort of things. First, since our stand-up two years ago, we have worked to increase our federal and contractor workforce to recover the investigative capacity we lost in 2014. We have exceeded that goal. At the same time, we introduced and implemented business practices and process improvements to include enhancement of technology that has enabled more efficient use of our workforce. And as a result, we have reduced the pending field work in our inventory by about 45 percent, reducing the workload by more than 2 million hours in a year. To give you an idea of some of these processes, we are implementing robotic automation, robotic process automation, RPA. And, deploy, and have deployed about 20 bots so far to streamline the existing investigative processes. This effort will automate manual, time-intensive activities to increase productivity, reduce the waste, and improve our timeliness. We've also developed and implemented an approach to rapidly assess completed cases based on a predictive model to expedite case closure to all of our customers. We have leveraged our strong partnerships with our customers to focus investigative capacity around high-density work areas. These hubs have been established around geographic clusters of civilian, military, and industry partners. And through this strategic approach, we have more efficiently completed hundreds of thousands of investigative items. These are just three examples of many we have worked on. The results of our combined effort have increased our monthly production rate by 15 percent, closing just under 60,000 cases every full week for the last quarter. And I expect that trend to continue actually to increase. Investigative infrastructure is critical to our success. As we work with our partner agencies, particularly the Department of Defense that has primary responsibility to develop and roll out the National Background Investigation Services, the future end-to-end -end investigative system, it is imperative that we continue to make efficient use of our current IT systems and maintain the security of those systems and that data until we transition fully into the NBIS. This will enable us to continue working down the inventory while also preparing and building for that future. Regarding that future, we are fully supportive and fully engaged with the Trusted Workforce 2.0, the interagency effort led by the executive agents to transform and modernize the personnel security process. Most of the processes we employ today are driven by policy constraints, some of which date back seven decades, and they need to be revamped to match today's environment and challenges. 
we at NBIB know from experience there is much to be gained through the strategic policy review. And in closing, while there is great focus on transferring and transforming this mission, there are over 10,000 people in the NBIB workforce, both federal and contract support, who are focused every day on executing this mission. It is our shared goal that while we work to transfer and transform this mission, our work is uninterrupted and we continue our current path to progress. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. I see Mr. Gallego has joined us and seek unanimous consent for him to participate as a full member of the subcommittee. So ordered. Mr. Reed, as this process goes forward, what will be the metrics that we use to determine whether or not this transfer has been successful? Will it be the duration until a decision has been made? Will it be you know, some customer satisfaction metric? Uh, you know, in, in my district, this is a major issue because we've got a number of people who leave military service having uh, very high clearances, and then they seek to go into the private sector, and even if they have a short lapse uh, in, in that time period, it becomes as if they are a person who is tabula rasa uh, to the intelligence community. And so, uh, if you could speak to that briefly. So, I'll offer you a two, two-part answer. And within the government, in terms of efficiency, the transfer of functions, resources, personnel, infrastructure that will currently reside within the Office of Personnel Management and transferring those to the Department of Defense. We have developed a transfer timeline. The intent of this is to go from the first of the year, from January, and complete those transfers by the beginning of, of uh, FY20, nine, uh, through 30 September next year. So we have a nine-month window to complete those transfers, and we are working the fine details of the incremental transfers of those things. And we have a series of plans to go through, such as a human capital, right? You have over 2,000 federal employees transferring from one agency to another. So as we work through those details, we'll establish a series of gates for deliberate transfers of functions and resources. Now, that's really inside the government. Your question, however, was more about the external facing. What do people see? And what's the difference to the customer, right? So that goes to two parts. One is the continued progress that we will make working with the same people that are doing it now, but now transferred under a DOD framework to work down the inventory. As the inventory works down, you have more resources to apply to existing cases, so you speed up your timeliness. Our immediate goal right now is to get into federally mandated timeliness standards, which are 40 days at the secret level, 80 days at the top secret level. We're operating way beyond that right now. But we see no reason why, through normal process, as we get that inventory down and we have these assets working on it, we can inch those numbers back down. But keep in mind, the third part of the answer is what both my colleagues referred to is that the executive agents are in the middle of a process now to re-examine the entire system. Uh, and this is this trusted workforce system. Some of those will be implemented concurrent with everything I just said, and that will establish new efficiencies and new timelines that we have yet to map out. But the good news is for those awaiting a clearance, it will be a faster process. It's already proving to be a faster process. We're very confident we can get down into those guidelines and we can probably go even further. As we talked about this issue of reinvestigations and using automated records check and continuous evaluation, currently it's a several, uh, it's upwards of 100 days to longer to get a reinvestigation done. As Mr. Phelan said, nobody's put out of work while that's happening, but nobody likes to be in limbo, right? As we implement the new process, you won't be waiting on a reinvestigation. That, that will be a continuous process. So that time component goes away completely. It also allows us to focus on the front end, where we do our initial into the government, our initial checks, right? The fact that we have this continuous evaluation, continuous vetting framework that's now maturing as we go will make us more able to bring folks through the front end investigative process knowing we're going to enroll them in a, in a CE program, right? So those will all go down. Thank you. I can submit the remainder of the majority's questions in writing for response. Mr. Moulton, we uh, have had votes called, and so I don't know uh, how many uh, members of the minority have questions, but I'm certainly uh, happy to proceed under the five-minute rule and, and uh, yield to you. But if you'd like to utilize any of that time to yield to your colleagues, that, that'd be fine as well. Your, Mr. Moulton's recognized for five minutes. Uh, gentlemen, I'll just ask um, one question. We'll start with Mr. Reed. Um, you know, fundamentally, I want to understand what is the audit process for this? We've, un we've learned a lot about continuous evaluations. We've learned about automation. I think a lot of these innovations make sense and ultimately should improve the process while also making it more efficient. But we're not talking about, you know, automating a grocery store inventory here where if a few tomatoes fall through the cracks, you just have some lost tomatoes. 
we can't let one single mole fall through the cracks here. So how are we protecting that? How are we ensuring that we have some manual cover or backup for the automated processes as we're implementing them for the first time? Well, there's a couple of parts to that as well. Uh, first of all, it's very important for to point out that human beings are involved in this process every step of the way. There's not a, a security clearance machine that's grinding in the background, sending out notices saying, you, you know, you don't have a clearance. We have a, a vetting uh, center that we have established that Mr. Payne has established, the director sitting right behind us here, and she has built up this capability to process what we do now and we'll do on scale is we receive alerts through continuous evaluation. We go through a process to validate those alerts, right? Is this a valid alert? Is this the right person? Are we associating this alert with this person? Is that correct? Is the identity matching? Is the information credible? Then we go through a process to assess the significance of those alerts and apply them to a framework to make a decision should this be a change in their status. That's all monitored and regulated by people. It, it brings together the adjudicative functions with investigative functions in a new sort of dynamic fashion. That is the way we will evolve in the future. So you will always have trained adjudicators and trained information specialists working together to validate and verify and, and validate the system that it's working properly and that action is being taken, I think, to your point on the audit side, what are you doing about this? And are you doing the right thing based on the right information? So we've built that now. The challenge is to scale up for the full department. We're in the early months of that, but there's nothing keeping us from, from extending beyond that. This will be as we transfer workforce, right? People that are doing things a certain way, as we adopt new processes, then they adopt and they get trained into those methods as well. This will be a question that I think will continue to come up as we want to make sure that we understand that not only is this process getting more efficient and the backlog is going down, um, but it's just as secure or more secure than it's been in the past. Um, my colleagues are going to submit their questions for the record. I just have one more question for Mr. Payne very quickly. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Payne, that you're moving to a risk-based risk approach to personnel vetting. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we have not had a risk-based approach up until this point? Well, I, I would say that we've we've covered the board uh, uh, in in uh, uh, on risk. Uh, we we've done everybody at periodic at the same periodic point uh, uh, of reinvestigation five years. So everybody's ago. been the same. Yeah, everybody's we've never been. The same. been a, we ha we have not been assessing people based on the, their risk to the to the enterprise. There there's been movements where we have. Um, Elevated people, like uh, for example, uh, those who have uh, um, 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 administrative access, administrator access for for IT systems. Some agencies have done that, but by and large, it's been a five and a ten year process. Every five, every ten years, this gives us the opportunity actually to really focus our investigative resources on the areas where we need to focus them. So if we're getting hits. Uh, uh, from a continuous evaluation standpoint on a particular individual, well, maybe that's the individual we want to focus on for a deeper reinvestigation as opposed to um, um, someone who um, we're, we're not coming up with anything, uh, uh, they, they seem to be leading a, a pretty clean life. Um, let's put the resources on, on those individuals that, that are the riskiest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Thank you, gentlemen. We're, we'll have additional questions we'll submit in writing, but this concludes our subcommittee hearing and the meeting's adjourned.